So welcome everybody to our fireside chat today with Holly, Holly Sutherland, who for many years was the director of um, the Euromod team at ISA and um, um, is also part of the board of the DRM uh, program. So uh, we are very glad to have you here um, gathering with us around our virtual fireplace. So you can hear the fire crackling in the back. And um, we have recorded the first part of this conversation, but there will be part, uh, a part where you can ask questions interactively later on. So that much up front for the audience. So Holly, great to have you. Um, I, I will start in the very early days um, and with a very simple question. How did you first come in touch with micro simulation? Ah, oh, well, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to to join you it's a it's a lovely crackly fire um so i think i first came into micro simulation through doing work on the uk back in the 80s 1980s um and from that uh the idea of using um micro simulation to do comparisons across countries, comparisons of the effects of policies in different economic and social contexts to try and understand more about policy effectiveness, I suppose. I mean, that would be back in the mid 90s that we were doing that. And just for uh, a selection of countries based on the idea that we were a group of people working together anyway, and we could see that micro simulation would be a way of answering the questions that, that we had about the different systems. So the countries were a few EU countries, France, Ireland, UK, Italy, I think were the first ones. And the idea, we all had our own national models, um, but the idea was that because they use different assumptions that were hardwired into these models and they had all been built in different ways, we needed to build something designed for comparisons. Um, so that's what we did. Um, so the idea was not so much, it was really just to, to in, inform that research on, on you know, inequality and poverty and the different effectiveness of, of policies in, in, in these different national contexts. And then, of course, that led almost naturally to the idea of having a European model. So being able to have a model that would not only look at, but compare the effects in different EU countries, but to look across the EU, to look at the EU as a whole. And in doing that, we were sort of way ahead of what the the policy demands were at the time. This was very much an academic project. Um, and so we did that for the for the EU15. And what that meant was that we had to build something that was very flexible and that could cope with different data, because it was before the EU silk for the for the EU. We were using different data for each country. Um, and obviously different policy systems. And it was almost as a byproduct of that that we realised that we could um, make use of the framework that we built to, you know, easily, quickly build models for countries that didn't have models already. So as the EU expanded, we did that for um, the new member states. And then it became obvious that we we could also use the same framework to build models for countries that didn't have them. And in fact, that were in quite different uh, sort of economic contexts. And the very first um, experiment uh, was with South Africa um, and where Michael Noble, Michael Noble and uh, and, and Gemma Wright were, I think they approached me, I can't remember, I, you know, we, we had a, it was one of those, you know, real fireside chats, I think, where we happened to meet up and talk about it. And the idea of trying to build a model for South Africa came up. So 
the idea of having a common framework for building models for different countries, which I suppose is what I ended up um, following my career, was that's what it was, um, was a sort of byproduct of the, the fact that we'd already had to de develop something that was flexible in a way that a, a single national model for a single set of purposes didn't didn't have to be. Okay, so I have now just out of curiosity a question. What software did you use initially? Are we well for the the first UK models we were using um, the very first model I wrote was for a mainframe because mm -hmm. we didn't have PCs then. And I used a combination of SPSS and Fortran. Uh, <laughs> so those are the days. Um, then we rewrote the UK model using C++. Mm -hmm. um, but when we when we first wrote the first uh, comparative multi-country model, we used we used Excel. Mm -hmm. So we didn't use the I think the very first run that we actually used Excel calculation um, engine mm. um, because that was a common that was a software that was common and easily available and that everybody could use or easily learn to use. I mean, it was it was not ideal, so mm. we moved we moved on from that quite quickly, and so the. The software that we used was again C++ for the for the engine, the bit that nobody ever has to look at that's written by programmers. <laughs> um, but this, the way in which Yoramod looks even now with those columns mm -hmm. um, was based on that original idea from Excel. We could see how that sort of column structure, having a column for a policy mm -hmm. system, um, that, that that could be made to work mm -hmm. and so although it, it's a long way from Excel now there are still mm -hmm. some some things that we um, that we sort of discovered along the way that turned out to be useful because I mean, in the beginning we were all we had no programmers as such working mm -hmm. on the project it was all we were all economists at the time and we would all mm -hmm. picked up what we needed to pick up and went and tried mm. to learn things and it was very much not an expert programmer's program and mm. probably some programmers looking at it now would say the same thing but it was it was fit for purpose because mm. we could, we could uh, we could do we could make it do what we wanted it to do it, it has worked it's still working yes. <laughs> so but that, when did you start to call it Euromod? Um, I think that was with the first, um, the EU 15, so when there was only 15 countries in the EU, it was when we first had, we built that model. Um, we built a sort of prototype model, first of all, because that was where the, the funding went. We had funding from the EU scientific programmes and um, they didn't really believe that what we were promising, which was an EU model, they didn't believe either that it was possible or that it was useful, which was um, a sign of the times, I think. And I think it's now very much recognised as a, a useful thing by the by the Commission anyway. Um, but at the time, they didn't see it. So we, we had, a instead of giving us a big grant to build a model, they gave us a small grant to prove that it was possible to build a prototype and to, if you like, try and sell it, to, to, to explain why this was something that they were going to, or policymakers and academics working on policy issues were going to find useful. So we did those things and then we had funding to, to build the whole thing. But I think the, the term Euromod was um, first invented when we first put in the, the big proposal mm -hmm. we we've always had a bit of trouble with it because it's uh it's a kind of obvious name to use you know for for, for a european model um, but it's actually copyrighted by um fine uh, the fashion industry 
So there are various Euromod and Euromode um, sort of trademarks that are registered. So we've never been able to, we never were able to sort of own the word, but we carried on regardless since we felt that we weren't really in competition with the, the fashion industry. That's interesting. I um, Yeah, that you consider yourself not to have been in competition with the fashion industry. You mentioned um, the South African model and actually um, Michael Noble will be another guest in this series mm. um, in the upcoming, I think, uh, for the next day that he will be speaking with my colleague Rodrigo Oliveira. Um, so we can actually check whether that idea was or happening at a real fireplace with Michael Noble. <laughs> And it, it brings me uh, also back to, to, to the next question, basically. So obviously the South African model was in a way the front runner um, for a model that's not from a developed or a European country specifically. But like when you first heard that at Univida there's the idea of, of building such models, like what, what, what did you first think? Like were you like, oh, these, are, these people are crazy. Oh, great that finally someone comes around with it or like your, your just your, your initial reaction well there were sort of two initial reactions because in fact the, there had been talk of doing some micro simulation for africa um for africa before sometime before south france um so i think the idea had been around for a while but didn't actually um, gel in the way that Southmont has gelled. Um, so it was not a single moment. Um, I have always been keen for the work that we've done and the ideas that we've had and the approach that we took for, for EU countries to be picked up and adapted if necessary and carried out anywhere in, in the world. And in fact, it's one of the things I'm most proud of that that happened and South Mod, well, first of all, the, the SA Mod, the South Africa um, experience was a, was such a great sort of trailblazer. Um, but then the idea of doing something for, for, for several countries and really with a rather open agenda about where it might lead was, of course, really exciting. I was, it was exciting, but I was also concerned that um, people wouldn't think it was easier than it was. Or, because again, this is my experience going back with the EU and with Euromod and even with the UK, is that when people hear the word model, they think that this thing is going to be able to do anything. Um, I had the experience a long time ago with a, a, a very clever uh, person working for the European Commission. She wasn't, she was, you know, by no means stupid or ill-prepared, but she asked me if Euromod could um, predict um, the effect, the gendered effects of um, increased uh, R&D funding to the aerospace industry. Well, um, I mean, the quick answer is no, not really. I mean, the long answer could be, well, it depends what else you have there, possibly. It could be part of some kind of analysis, but it wouldn't be the first place you'd look. And so I do have, I mean, I'm, I'm very aware that people often think that this model will answer all the questions that they might have. And so one always had to be careful not to raise expectations too high and to be quite practical. Mm. And I'd always been keen on the idea of having quite simple and quite appropriate for the, for the model questions to look at first as a way of demonstrating the kind of core things that the, the model could do. Um, I don't know, you know, the distribution effects of a, of a new simple child benefit, that, that kind of thing, mm. um, as a way of, of trying to 
help people understand what it what it can do. And then, of course, there are all the steps after that about explaining how that's not the end of it. That one can be, you know, there are a lot. There's basically we can't we can't imagine all the questions that we can answer. Mm. Um, that they they, they they will come along and people will have new ideas based on work that's been done already and so on. It's a kind of dynamic, organic sort of process. Mm. I think I can say from inside that both your initial reactions uh, to a certain extent have held true, like it has and is still surely sometimes a challenge and, and kind of um, navigating the expectations towards the models is a constant challenge, obviously. And um, um, on the other hand, um, I think we can say that they are there and um, they are coming out of infants of, of the very infant stage. We're going into the toddler stage, I think, at this point. Um, and actually, then let me tie in my third um, question in that way as well. So now if you think forward, um, what would you where do you see Southmont going? Like, or where would you want to see it going? Oh, it's not up to me to want. I mean, I, all all I would want is that it that it's used and that it makes a difference, and that the people who work with it love working with it. <laughs> um, I mean, I think there are. This is a bit of a, a, a an aside, but there are there are this, there are people who really love doing this kind of work and. If they do, they should be grabbed and given the opportunity. Um, it, it's it's always been such a, a a pleasure for me to work with teams of people with, who have enthusiasm for, for for this work. But I think there's another thing to bring in here, which is the question of data. Mm. So the models are not anything much unless they have good data. Mm. You can make up for data problems to some extent but in the end if you have no data you have no model um, and I think in a way that's that's the future direction for the sort of technical sides of the model is of the models is to is to improve and in a sense diversify the the data that they that they run off so thinking about administrative data of various sorts, but also um, forging strong links with data providers so that the data that, that is available um, is improved and that the data providers understand uh, the needs of the model. Mm. Um, so I, th I think I think that's that's what that's the future. It's also the past. I mean, it's always been necessary to to try and build good relationships with with data providers, not just about access and availability, but also about improving what's mm. there. Um, obviously, that's difficult because there are there are always um, many demands on on you know particular data. But um, I think well, I think I think it's. Uh, it's an essential part of of carrying the the things forward. Yeah. The other thing, of course, is making sure that the models are used and that that everyone who has a use for them has an opportunity to 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 use them. That they're not just hidden away in a single person's office. That they're that they're disseminated well. And of course, I know you've been running training courses, but thinking about how to do that in the um, in the most effective way is is uh, is it is always there but it's something that depends on the context it depends mm. on who's who's being trained why they why they want to or are being asked to to learn how to to use the model and what what they will do with it I mean I see every use of the model and even any training course is an investment. So it's it has its its immediate effect, but it also has potentially a kind of longer term dynamic effect. Yeah. 
thank you for this. Um, now um, we'll close the recording here and um, uh, go over to taking questions to follow up what we just started to discuss about. So here we are. Um, and uh, because I already had the opportunity to ask Holly so many questions, um, we can um, uh, have anyone else ask follow up questions of what we just started discussing. You can either put them in the chat, um, but I'm also happy if you just um, speak up if that's technically possible, Anna. Yeah, uh, I think it's possible so that people can ask uh, to share video and audio and I will admit them in and then, then they can speak. So we can do that very well. Okay, so we have a few more minutes uh, so you can basically just shoot away and just ask then uh, Anna uh, or just try to speak and then Anna will, will let you in. Mm. So um, actually I think Holly, we can follow up one of the questions we had, because I think Michael is actually here in this room. And uh, we can actually check with Michael. Was it so, Michael, that actually um, Holly made the match between at the time Jukka and, uh, and you guys at Sasbury in the very early stage of Southmont? Do you remember, Michael? Michael, are you able to ask for to be let in? I need to admit you in first. It's the blue button you should see on your screen. I think it says ask to share, Michael, if you want to. Mm, ask to share video, audio, if you see a button like that. Mm, I don't know if he's written something. <laughs> ah, he's answering by writing. Yes, Holly was yes. the matchmaker. <laughs> Holly was the matchmaker. So now we know Holly. <laughs> so, um, may I, I ask something actually? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> go quickly. go for it, Anna. <laughs> yeah. So my, I'm just uh, interested because I don't know so much about these topics still. So, is there some examples like how the Euromod has been used? Like, uh, have you collected some kind of impact stories or like, uh, or is it very widely used nowadays to like in everyday decision making in, in the EU? I hope I can be heard now. Yes, yes, yes we can hear you. So I'm the, there, is, there are plenty of impact stories and also academic papers that have used Euromod. I, I would direct you um, both to the uh, website at Essex, the ISA website, to look at the, the Euromod and the microsimulation pages there. But I would also direct you to the Euromod uh, website at uh, the JRC at the European Commission because they also uh, put material on the web about how the model's being used currently um, at the Commission. There is a, there's a, a, a working paper series where um, when Essex was in charge of Euromod, we used to ask that all analysis, that um, all sort of substantial analysis was, was published through that as a way of collecting together a kind of library of of ideas and analysis that, that other people could uh, improve on or build on or whatever. Um, but certainly there, there are now two web places to, to look at um, impact type studies too. I don't know if somebody wants to put the web mm, address it's there. On. Yeah. Matteo Aridi, thank you. Yeah, thanks Matteo. Yeah, thank you. And I think actually, yeah, we have to, I think, close this soon, Anna, right? Because we, we need to be super much on time in these online conferences. I think so. Maybe we can have just one quick question. Yeah, can we have one more question? Okay, yeah. so if there's one more question, please, you can type it in the chat. It seems it's a bit hard to get let in. Yeah, maybe. Um, that's it. So, so we see a lot of hellos in the chat, which is <laughs> nice too. So that's the part that we're missing from a real live conference. You would now 
go mm. away for a beer probably. Oh, is I there think Rodrigo? Rodrigo will yes. come and ask something. Yeah. Rodrigo, go ahead. Hi. Uh, Hello. Sorry, I'm without the video because I was not prepared for that. <laughs> but uh, I have one question. Uh, tomorrow we will uh, listen a lot uh, from Michael about this somewhat. But I'm I have this curiosity about how how was the process for other countries to decide to develop their models for other developing countries. So was uh, the countries needed to to approach you or was the, the, the Evermod team and the University of XX and all the partners that went to the country and uh, helped to, uh, then to think and, and propose to develop the model? Well, I think it's a, it's a mixture. Um, and I think I mean, it's almost Pierre that should be answering this question in relation to the countries that are part of Southmod. It was very much initiatives taken by people at UNU Wider. It was a little bit initiatives taken when people contacted me and I wanted, and I passed on the ideas that there were people in countries that wanted to build models themselves. So there were also, uh, Gemma and Michael had lots of contacts in other um, Southern African countries. So there was all sorts of, um, ways in which people were were in it, make, make, taking the initiative and from the, the the Euromod side at the time it was both the more the merrier but also we were aware that um it's it, we the, the effort needed not to be spread too thin and that there were some fundamental ne necessary conditions for building a good model data being one of them, and people who are prepared to commit themselves and who are in a position to commit themselves being another. Um, I, I, I'll stop there because I know we're short of time, but I think it's something that um, that the PL may well have a very long answer to about how these countries get chosen and, and what happens, and maybe you can continue it at the, the Michael Fireside. Oh, by the way, I think Matteo is missed in some other session, if I'm understanding right. So I maybe... think all, a lot of us will right move over to Yeah, another... okay, well, in that case. <laughs> so I think we, we're going to like run out of this room and run into the next room. But before that, I want to thank you, Holly, for making the time. I know you have very important uh, commitment now coming up with your grandson. But thank you for, for taking the time. And uh, look forward to next time. Thank you so much, Holly. Thank you. Bye. Bye.